It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Congratulations to all those wonderful graduates. It's, it's always funny to see these, these young people graduating, and, and I look at them and I think, I remember when you were born. And then I say, those little rascals make me feel old. <laughs> but congratulations to all of them. It's wonderful to see this, uh, this new generation of Christ followers going out into the world, taking the gospel message of Jesus with them. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I pray you do, I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 13. It's on page 900 of your Black Pew Bible. A man walked into a, a gift shop that was selling religious items, and, and near the cash register, he noticed a display of caps that had WWJD printed on them, and, and he was puzzled over what those letters meant. He couldn't figure it out, so finally he asked the clerk, he said, uh, what, what does that stand for? And the clerk said, well, it stands for what would Jesus do? He said it was meant to inspire people not to make rash decisions, but rather to contemplate what the Lord Jesus would do in the same situation. Well, the man thought for a minute and said, well, I would venture to say that Jesus wouldn't pay $18 for an ugly hat. <laughs> of course, WWJD, What Would Jesus Do?, came from the 1896 book, by Charles Sheldon called In His Steps. And, and, and it was subtitled, What Would Jesus Do? It made a resurgence in the 1990s. Uh, people were wearing bracelets and t-shirts and, and ball caps like that. Now, fortunately for us, brothers and sisters, we don't have to ask, what would Jesus do? Because we knew what Jesus did. We, we know what Christ Jesus did. I personally know what Christ Jesus did for me in my life. I know what he's done in my heart, how he, is, he has taken a, a filthy sinner and has cleansed that filthy sinner through repentance and faith, and, and he, has, he has saved me, and he has set me apart for himself. I pray that he's done the same thing for you. That's a choice that we have to make. But we don't have to ask, what would Jesus do? We know what Jesus did. Our motto should rather be DJWD. Uh, do what Jesus did. I, I got that backwards, didn't I? <laughs> DWJD, yeah. But the, but the answer is the same. Do what Jesus did. And, and that's why we've been studying uh, the, this, this series, Everyday Disciple, for the past six weeks. Uh, because we're looking at what a disciple truly is. Uh, week one, we looked at what a cultural Christian was. And prayerfully, I hope that for those of you who are here and you heard that sermon, you, you took a little, a little look at yourself to decide whether or not you were a follower of Jesus or if you were simply a cultural Christian. Uh, we looked at, at serving. We looked at worship. Uh, we looked at connecting with one another. We're sharing the gospel. Because we know that disciples make disciples. There is a multiplication in the disciple-making process. If you're a believer here today, there is a, a crimson thread that leads all the way back to Calvary, where somebody saw Jesus or somebody heard the gospel from someone who saw what Jesus did, and they shared with somebody, and that person shared with somebody else, all the way to you. Because it all leads back to the cross and to the empty tomb. Now, last week we learned that you can't lead people where they need to go until you connect with them, where they're at. And we're never going to have a desire or take the initiative to build a bridge for other people to come to Jesus until we see people the way that Jesus sees people. Until we love people like Jesus loves people. Until we serve people like Jesus serves people. And today we're going to look at one of the most incredible stories in all of the Gospels. And the reason that this story is so incredible is that it revolves around a towel, a bowl of water, and filthy feet. Now the backdrop of the story is, is, is just 24 hours before the crucifixion. Jesus knows he is going to the cross. It's the Thursday before Good Friday. He's going to be crucified in less than 24 hours. And he's teaching the disciples an object lesson about dirty feet. But it's really not about people's feet. It's about people's hearts. It's one of the most amazing pictures of the Son of God in any of the four Gospels, and it illustrates one of the greatest lessons that we're ever going to learn 
not only about what it means to be a disciple, but the blessing that comes from it when we are. We're going to be reading John's Gospel, chapter 13. It's up on the screen. It's on page 900 of your Black Pew Bible. And as always, I'd like to ask you, if you're able, to please stand for the reading of the Word of God. John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only, my, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has, been, who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he, know, he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning humble to be in your presence and thankful that we serve a God that is willing to stoop, a God that is willing to condescend, a God that is willing to leave the glories of heaven to come to this disgusting, filthy, sin-filled world. And your motivation was quite clear. It was love. We thank you, Father, for your love for us. We thank you for sending Jesus to suffer and die on a cross for our sins. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. That same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us. And we praise you. Thank you for that, God. I pray that your word, because we know it, always accomplishes that for which it's sent forth. I pray, God, that your word would speak to our hearts today. Help us to examine ourselves, Father. Help us to see if we truly love you if we truly love others the way you want us to, the way you command us to. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. If we're going to live like Jesus, if we're going to touch people the way that Jesus did, if we're going to do what Jesus did, we've got to do three things. First, Jesus tells us we've got to show our love. Uh, Now, we can't imagine the absolute pressure that Jesus is under here. Uh, the emotional stress that he's going through. And uh, remember, Jesus is 100% God, but he's also 100% man. And he knows that his hour has come. That, that's, that's what John tells us. It's, it's the, the feast of the Passover. They're celebrating their third Passover together. He knows that he is the ultimate lamb. He is the ultimate Passover lamb that's getting ready to go to the cross to be sacrificed for the sins of not just many, but of the world. He knows that. And, and Jesus, it's, it says here why, why he did this. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, for three years, Jesus had loved these guys like they had never been loved. And on top of that, he modeled love for them. He showed them what love truly was. See, the Greeks differentiated love. We, we have... We, that one word, love. Uh, I, I, I made a statement years ago 
when I was talking about love, and I, and I said, love can mean many things. I love my wife, and I love donuts. That's clearly not the same thing. Now, my, my, my brother Greg Carr, who is now in heaven, he made a sound bite that he sent to me that said, I love donuts, uh, of my voice. And I was going to use it as a ringtone, but I chose not to. But love can mean many different things. And in the Greek language you see on your screen here, four different things for love. Eros, th that is the strong, desirous love, the sexual, passionate love that is constrained to a marriage bed between a man and a woman, and somebody say amen. amen. That's eros. Storge, mentioned one time in Romans. That, that is a, an affection between families, between a parents loving their children, or a brother and sister's kind of love. And then you have phileo. Now that is a fraternal kind of love. I love my hunting buddies. I, I, I love the guys I play golf with. It, it's, it's, it's friendly. That's where the word Philadelphia gets its name, the city of brotherly love. And then there's agape. That is the kind of love that Jesus is using here, agapao. And that is a self-sacrificial love. That is love in action. And listen, it is not instinctive in us, and it certainly is not natural in us. It's used approximately 250 times in the New Testament. It's a spiritual love that goes far beyond anything the human heart could manufacture on its own. It's the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated for us, to us, and it's the kind of love that Jesus expects us. In fact, he commands us to demonstrate as well. In John 13, 34, just a few, few scriptures down from here, he tells those disciples in that same room, after, after they just witnessed what he did, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now, Jesus is not giving this as an option or, or as, a, as a good suggestion, he's giving this to them as a commandment, a new commandment. Now, love's not a feeling, because you can't command somebody to feel something. Agape love is an action. Agape love has feet. Agape love has hands. Agape love has a heart. And you can't command someone to, to, to obey a, a, a feeling. It's not an obligation. I should say it's not optional. It's, it's an obligation for Christians to exemplify agape love. See, Jesus takes a word that is normally used as a noun, and he turns it into a verb. And this tells us that love's not a feeling. It's a choice. Liking someone is an emotion. Liking someone is a feeling. I, I can't tell you to like me, but Jesus tells you that you got to love me. <laughs> so I got you there. And let's face it, there's people that you don't like, but you still have to love them. <laughs> okay, you two. I, I, hear, I see that down there. They're, they're giving each other the stink eye. Yeah, there, there, there's people that, that you love that you don't necessarily like. And that's just human nature. So you can't, Jesus can't command us to, to like people, but he does tell us that we have to love one another. See, love's not a matter of can't or can. It's a matter of will or won't. Uh, we are commanded to do that. There's a big difference between liking people and loving people. You see, we, Jesus never commands us to like our enemies but he tells us to love our enemies. He tells us to pray for those who persecute us. See, liking somebody is an emotional response. Liking has nothing to do with loving. Love's a choice. Now, Jesus, in the next chapter, we're going to say this, John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is the last commandment that he gives to his disciples. And if we're going to do what Jesus did, and if we're going to love how Jesus Loved, we have to first show our love to him by obeying his commands, and his commandments to us is that we love one another. Second, he tells us to surrender ourselves. Verse 3 says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going 
back to God. Now, very carefully, look at that. It says, everything was under his power. Jesus is in complete control. He is the sovereign God of the universe. He can do anything that he wants. He can bark orders at these disciples. He can tell them, hey, you boys, you, you wash the feet. What does Jesus do? Verse 4, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist and he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Read that very slowly and think about that. See, foot washing in those days was a very, very common practice. We don't see that kind of thing much anymore. But back then, people wore open-toed sandals or they went barefoot. They, they, they went hillbilly. Uh, and, and back then, roads weren't paved, so they had mud, they had animal dung, they had human excrement, oftentimes, on their feet. They were filthy. And when you would come to somebody's house, there would be a basin of water and a slave, not a Jewish slave, because Jews didn't wash feet. It would have to be a Gentile slave that would wash feet. You'd take off your shoes, and that slave would wash your gross toes. Uh, I, I, for those people here who may be podiatrists, God bless you. God bless you. I go to a podiatrist. I'm going to tell you something. I don't envy that gentleman. I, I like him. Nice guy. But I'm going to tell you what, the first time I went there, it looked like my feet were throwing up gang signs, right? Like, my toenails were all over the place. It looked like Fritos. I'm going to let that set with you for a few minutes, all right? All right. Not anymore, not anymore. But feet are gross. And friends, first century feet were really, really gross. When you rented a room back then, you rented a slave. You notice the disciples didn't do that. You notice the disciples did not have someone there to wash feet. And so Jesus does two things to make it perfectly clear to the disciples what he's doing and the role he is assuming. He takes off his outer clothing and he wraps a towel around his waist. <clears throat> Slaves didn't own robes. And if you saw somebody with a towel wrapped around his waist, you knew he was a slave. Jesus is telling him, I'm showing you my love by becoming your slave. What's he doing? He's surrendering his power. All power has been given to him. See, there's a difference between being weak and being meek. Meekness is a restraint of power for the good of others. And Jesus was meek, but Jesus was not Weak, he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And he was the one person that was the most overqualified for this job, and yet he did it anyway. See, parents, we have power over our children for a while. CEO, company owner, you have power over your employees. If you're the captain or the coach of a team, you have power over that team. If you're the principal of a school, you have power over the school. If you're the teacher in a class, hopefully you have power in that class. But whatever authority, whatever influence that you have, God did not give it to you so that you could use it for your benefit. He gave it to you so that you could use it for the benefit of others. So your spouse and your kids and your employees and your coworkers and your students and your players, your love for Jesus and your love for them. See, when everybody else is throwing in the towel, an everyday disciple is picking it up. An everyday disciple is willing to step in and do things when other people simply aren't willing to do it. An everyday disciple is willing to serve where nobody else is willing to serve. Every one of those other disciples, they smelled those feet. And they saw those feet. Why didn't they do something about it? Well, I would venture to say the same reason many of us don't. Because they were focused on themselves. They weren't really surrendering themselves to the good of others. They were worried about themselves. They were looking out for themselves. Jesus was looking out for them. And he was looking out for them 
and love. Now, Luke gives us a further look into what was going on that night. See, there was an argument going on. In Luke chapter 22, this is what Dr. Luke tells us. A dispute arose among them as to which of them would be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one that reclines at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. These guys weren't interested in serving. They were interested in being served. They, they weren't interested in towels. They were interested in ruling. They were interested in power. Jesus surrendered that power. And this is the example that he is showing to them. I heard a story about a mom who was fixing pancakes for her two sons. Ryan was five and Kevin was three, and the boys were starting to argue over who would get the first pancake. And she said, now boys, I'm going to teach you a lesson here. If Jesus was here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake I can wait. Kevin turned to his brother and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. And that's what the disciples were doing that night. They wanted to be first. They wanted to be the ones who were being served. And there's something very wrong with this picture. We see the hands of a holy God washing the feet, the stinking, disgusting feet of men. That's just not right. You see, not only should the disciples have been washing his feet, they should have been fighting with each other over who was going to get the privilege of washing the feet of Jesus Christ. You see, that basin of water sat there while they argued amongst themselves over who was going to be great. And Jesus did for them what they were not willing to do for him. And 2,000 years later, friends, we often do the exact same thing. We want Jesus to bless us. We want Jesus to serve us. We want Jesus to fill us. When we should be showing our love and surrendering our lives. And by the way, we don't get to pick who we choose to serve. We can't just serve people we like. We can't just serve people who like us. We can't serve people who serve us. We have to serve everybody. People who serve you and people who don't serve you. Because remember this in verse 2. During supper when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus washed his feet just the same. Jesus is God. He knew full well that Judas was going to betray him, and yet he knelt down and he washed his feet as well. We should be willing to do for others what others are not willing to do for us. We need to surrender ourselves. Finally, we need to serve others. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will. And Peter did. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And he said to him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now Peter's response really does reveal a lot about Peter, but also about us too. You see, he knew that Jesus was doing for him what he should have been doing for Jesus. He was also, he should have also been doing that for the other disciples. Peter was the leader. Jesus is giving him a, a lesson in leadership that if you want to lead, you have to stoop. Someone called it descending into greatness. Humility goes a very, very long way. See, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. That was pride. What he should have been saying is, Jesus, I'll be more than glad to wash your feet. But he didn't do that. He was proud. He wasn't willing to surrender. And that's because he wasn't really loving Jesus the way that Jesus needed to be loved. Therefore, he didn't love the other disciples the way he should have loved them. To love people is to serve them. As the, as the husband in my marriage, I am the head of my home. Now, I know today people say, well, that's patriarchal. No, it's biblical. I am the head of my home. Now, my number one responsibility to my wife, Tina, is to love her. My number one job in my home is to use my power to serve her. And that goes with every role that I play in my life. 
My number one responsibility as a father is to love my children. My number one job is to serve them. Serve as an example. Show them what a godly Christian man is like. My, my number one responsibility as your pastor is to love you, and I do. I do. My number one job is to serve you. My number one responsibility as a leader is to love my staff, and I do. My number one job is to serve my staff. That response is not natural, friends. A B.C. Jimmy, before Christ, I wouldn't have done any of those things. I would have been like Peter. No, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus was probably saying, you better wash it because you're getting ready to stick it in your mouth. That is supernatural. And, and that is what Jesus is showing us. It comes from loving others and surrendering ourselves. Now, Jesus makes a key statement of this entire passage. He says in verse 10, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, he is moving from the physical illustration of washing feet to a spiritual picture of washing a dirty heart. There are two words in Greek for washing. Bathe means to bathe the entire body. Wash means to wash a specific part. Now, there is a difference between taking a bath and getting your feet washed. And that's not just true physically, it's also true spiritually. What Jesus is saying is when you come to Christ and surrender your life to Christ, that you confess that you are filthy with sin, that you need to be washed and that you need to be saved, he will do that. He will bathe you in his grace and in his mercy and in his love and in his forgiveness. And in the eyes of Jesus, you are completely clean. Salvation refers to being washed many times throughout Scripture, being cleansed. Salvation is to the body what a bath, or I should say salvation is to the soul, what a bath is to the body. We read that in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So just as a bath washes somebody on the outside, salvation washes somebody on the inside. And every one of these disciples had been washed except for Judas. And you would have never known that by looking at him. Scripture is very clear about that. None of the disciples knew that it was Judas. They even said, is it I, Lord? Am I the one who's going to betray you? They didn't even know. Because you can't tell who was saved and who was not saved by outside. And that includes their works, and that includes all the things that they do, and all the things that they give that's in their heart. See, Judas had a problem, and that is that he had never been bathed. I heard a, a story about a little boy who told his mom one evening, uh, she wanted him to take a bath. And he said, Mommy, can I wait until the morning to take my bath? And she said, No, son, we take a bath at evening before you go to bed because you're dirty. And he said, But, Mommy, please, I don't want to take my bath, and I don't want to take it in the morning. She said, No, go take your bath. He said, Mom, please. He kept begging her, and she was getting irritated. He said, Please let me take my bath in the morning. She said, What is your obsession with taking a bath in the morning? He said, Well, ever since school started, Teacher asks us every morning, how many of you have had your bath this morning? And I haven't been able to raise my hand all year. <laughs> Judas hadn't been bathed. Judas, he hadn't been washed. Now, Jesus only has to wash you one time in his saving grace, and you never need another bath. I hear people say, well, I've been saved many times. I know you haven't. You've either been saved once, or you haven't been saved at all, because Jesus only saves us one time. But listen, we go through this life, and when we walk around, there's no way we don't kick up dirt, the dirt of sin. And our feet get dirty with sin. This is the, this is the lesson that Jesus is telling him. There are dirty thoughts that, that, that muddle up your mind. There are dirty words that come out of your mouth. There are things that you do that you should not do, and there are things that you should do that you do not do. And when these things happen, our feet get dirty. But the good news is that we can take the dirtiest, the filthiest parts of our life, place it in the hands of Jesus, and he will clean it up. Listen to what Christ says in verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. But we will never be able to wash the feet of others until we allow Jesus to wash our feet. We all need to be bathed, and then once we are, we all need to be washed. We need to show our love, surrender ourselves, and serve others. When President Ronald Reagan died, George Herbert Walker Bush, who was vice president during his administration, was asked to do the eulogy. He told the story of how, in 1981, after Ronald Reagan had been shot through an assassination attempt, he was recovering uh, in the hospital, and just days after his surgery, one of his aides walked into his room to discover him on his hands and knees, wiping up water with a towel. And when the aide rushed over to ask what he was doing, he said, well, I was worried that my nurse might get in trouble. The most powerful man in the world at the time, bending down on his hands and knees to clean up spilled water. That is nothing compared to our almighty God our sovereign king, the only true God, condescending from heaven to earth, dying on a cruel Roman cross for our sins because we, friends, were in real trouble. We have a sin problem. Only Jesus can wash us. See, Jesus refused to throw in the towel. He picked it up. He came to seek, to serve, and to save. And he expects us to pick up the towel as well by showing our love, by surrendering ourselves, and by serving others. Has Jesus given you a bath? Are you clean? Jesus bids that you come to him, that you repent of your sins, that you lay them down, allow him to wash you and cleanse you. And brothers and sisters, if you are If you're saying, well, there's a problem in my life. I'm not living the Christian life like I think I should. It may be because you need Jesus to wash your feet. Maybe you need to come to him today. Maybe you need to dedicate your life or even rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus today. Let him bathe you. Let him wash you. Whatever the need be, you need to come to him today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that you are the God who cleanses us clean from all of our iniquity, all of our sin, and all of our stain. Father, we thank you for that divine detergent that flowed down Calvary's cross, that blood that washes away every spot and every sin. Father, we thank you that death could not hold you, that you rose mightily from the grave, and that you are alive, that you are ruling and reigning at this very second in time. And we praise you and thank you that you are our eternal and almighty God. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today that any sin that they've got that's coming between you and them, that they would ask you to forgive them. And that just as your word tells us that when we come to you, you are faithful and just, and that you will forgive us of our sin, that you will cleanse us and wash us whiter than snow. God, for those here today who don't know you as Savior, I pray that, Holy Spirit, during this time of invitation, you will do what only you can do. That you will convict their hearts, that you will show them their sin and their desperate need for Christ Jesus to save them. Lord God, we love you and we praise you. We pray all of this in the matchless name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to your heart and you need Jesus to forgive you of your sins, He will wash you clean right now. He'll give you that bath uh, that, that He gave to all the disciples. Maybe you're a believer and you need to confess to the Lord Jesus today some things you've been carrying around with you. Some things that are hindering your spiritual walk. You don't want to be a, a, a cultural Christian anymore. You want to be a disciple. You want to follow Jesus so closely You want to be behind your rabbi so close that that the dust from his feet gets on your cloak. All you have to do is reach out to Jesus. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus is just a prayer away. Our staff will be down front during this time of invitation. If you need to be baptized, if you'd like to join our church, 
Whatever your decision, whatever the Spirit's laying on your heart, please come as you feel led.